Hello and welcome to this DW Business Special looking at China's stalling economic recovery. A series of recent figures suggest that the world's second largest economy is struggling to reboot after its pandemic-induced slowdown. So let's get to the bottom of why that is with George Magnus. He's a research associate at Oxford University's China Centre and also at SOAS, that's the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Welcome to the programme, George. Thank you. So the Chinese economy, it isn't going in the direction that a lot of people had expected for 2023, is it? Sort of going in the right direction, as people expected, but not nearly as robustly as people thought was likely coming out of uh, China's zero COVID um, you know, experience during the last year or two. Um, we thought um, a lot of economists believed that it would, uh, would bounce back much more sharply uh, as we've seen in a number of other countries, but it's not really been the case. So some of the leading indicators which come out uh, each month um, for May, is the last month, for example, are back to where they were last December. The consumer has been partially, uh, you know, spending money on low ticket items, recreation, eating out, travel, but not on big items like housing and automobiles. And the investment side of the economy and the export side have both been a little bit disappointing. So, yeah, I mean, there is a recovery going on, but it's uh, it's not great. Well, let's get deeper into a few of those aspects over the next few minutes. Thank you very much. But I'm just going to give a quick overview, if I can, of the situation with China's economy. So let's just have a quick look at some of the warning signs that we are seeing that things are not moving as fast as many had expected, particularly in Beijing, when uh, it lifted those COVID restrictions at the end of last year. So China's factories may be back up and running, but exports are wavering. They plunged 7.5% in May, according to the country's Customs Bureau. Imports are also failing to meet expectations. They dipped by 4.5%, having declined in recent months too. It appears that Chinese citizens haven't been rushing to spend the money they saved up during zero COVID. Another economic red flag is China's surging public debt, which has hit 97% of GDP. And speaking of GDP, this year's growth target of 5%, which once seemed modest, is now looking increasingly hard to achieve. So let's bring back in George Magnus on this. Professor Magnus, what has gone wrong in the early months of 2023 that means China's economy is not moving and not bouncing back as quickly as had been expected? Well, I think there, there are two things that are basically ailing China a bit. Um, I mean, one of them, I think a lot of people uh, know quite a lot about already, which is the fact that the economy in China faces a number of uh, structural or systemic headwinds, which are constraining its capacity to grow um, over the medium term and probably mean that it can't really grow its speed limit now. It's probably down to about 2 or 3%. Um, but notwithstanding that, which I think most people thought would actually come back into play, you know, by the end of this year or early 2024, the cyclical rebound has also been rather soft. Um, and I think that's because the consumer, which um, Chinese politicians were very keen um, to, they wanted it to lead the recovery. And we heard a lot about this at the 20th Party Congress last year and at the National People's Congress in March of 2023, the consumer hasn't really been, um, you know, out on, uh, out on the town, as we might say. Um, and the reason for that is very poor levels of consumer confidence, probably um, affected by uh, disappointment about the housing market, which is a sort of a big drag on, on people's optimism, um, has been for a while and will continue to be so. Um, and also because, um, you know, if consumer spending is weak, it's usually because income is weak. And that's also a big structural problem, is the income share um, of consumers in China's economy actually is quite low. That's interesting. What, what it makes me wonder is, if you imagine a world where, you know, the, the, the two years of, you know, a, a basket case economic situation of the, the COVID pandemic uh, didn't happen, would we be say, seeing a similar trend with the Chinese economy anyway, then? I, I think we would have done. In fact, um, even without COVID, um, so if we go back to what was going on 
you know, in 2017, 2018, 2019, which seems like an eternity ago. Um, but even in those years, there, was un there were unmistakable signs that China's economy was slowing down uh, for all the reasons that I think we, you know, that have now become sort of common fare, really. So, you know, the overhang of debt, the demographic problem about aging, uh, the weakness of the uh, income and consumer um, a kind of metrics in terms of the total size of the economy, because China's economy is too geared towards investment rather than consumption. So this is a problem with the economic model. Uh, so all of these things were happening you know, before COVID. Obviously, COVID exacerbated both the trend and the volatility in China's economy. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we were all focused on the buildup of household deposits in the banking system during 2022, thinking that this would fuel what the Chinese called revenge consumption. Um, but it hasn't actually happened in the way that people imagined. So as I said, you know, things like eating out, travel, entertainment, recreation, this has come back in a, in a pretty decent way. Um, but the big ticket items that people spend money on, like housing and cars, hasn't. Now, it may still happen um, in the summer, um, but you know, we'll just have to wait and see whether that is actually delayed or whether, in fact, it won't happen. And then there are policy consequences if it doesn't happen. Yeah, and indeed, and consequences for, for imports and, and exports, which is something we'll definitely go into a little bit later on. But um, just talking about, you know, the, the, the GDP growth, a sign of how things are going is perhaps reflected in the fact that we are starting to hear, hear words of caution coming from people with close links to the government in Beijing. Just have a look at this quote that we've got here. It's from Professor Sun Li Ping at Tsinghua University in Beijing. He's a significant figure in China. He's said to have supervised the doctoral thesis of none other than Xi Jinping himself, although he hasn't confirmed that. But he says that he thinks in the next few years, China will face a period, a period of economic contraction that may not be short, as he put it. Professor Sun previously actually criticised Russia for invading Ukraine, now speaking his mind on the economy. So let's bring back in George Magnus on this. Are the Chinese people being prepared for the idea that decades of only really getting wealthier are over? Um, I, I think that message has certainly uh, gotten through to younger people. Um, right. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's possible there's a kind of a generational thing going on here where, you know, if you're uh, of an older generation and you remember you know, the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward and, you know, disasters and poverty that existed, um, you know, decades ago. But even today, you might feel that, you know, life is, is pretty good. I think younger people, certainly there's a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence to suggest that younger people um, have become rather frustrated about the um, pace of uh, growth in the economy, the limited opportunities for jobs. I mean, there's very high levels of youth unemployment in China, uh, which may be kind of a harbinger of things to come, of problems down the road. Um, and um, yeah, I think um, I think people are acclimatizing to the idea that, um, you know, that uh, the economy just isn't firing like it used to. Um, now, whether they fully understand the implications of China's development model and why it needs to change, I don't really know. I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's a little bit, um, a little bit kind of specialist for, I think, for, you know, for for the masses, as it were, for people to understand and integrate. Um, but that is the problem. The problem is that the old model in China doesn't really work anymore. And politically, it's quite difficult to change it. I just want to hear, uh, actually, another voice on the situation with the, the Chinese economy. This is a quote that we picked up earlier this week from Claire Lombardelli, who is chief economist at the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, also known as the OECD. Just have a listen to this. China is expected to see the sharpest positive shift of growth of any G20 economy this year due to the lifting of the zero COVID policy. We project growth of 5.4% this year and 5.1% next year. The reopening of China has also provided a boost to demand in other Asian economies. Over the past year, GDP growth has remained relatively strong and close to potential in other parts of Asia. So, Professor, what do you make of that characterisation from the, the OECD uh, growth of over 5% this year? Does that paint a, uh, a realistic picture? Well, statistically, it's correct, I think. Um, 
but of course, you know, I mean, what um, Claire Lombardelli didn't say, maybe she, I mean, I'm pretty sure she knows it. Um, but in that clip, we obviously we didn't hear, of course, that the comparison with 2022 is really easy, right? Because right. last year was such a terrible year that actually not really much has to happen in 2023 uh, to come up with a, a pretty decent growth rate. So I think what a, what a lot of economists are looking at really is how does this year's economic performance levels of you know automobile sales and housing sales and so on and so forth how do these things uh, stack up against what the economy was doing in 2019 which is below well, before uh, covid um, hit and the answer is not very well i mean most levels of most indicators are materially below where they were or will be this year materially below what they were in 2019. So, um, so, so China's lost something, as, as many economies did actually during COVID, um, and they're basically starting to kind of um, rev up again a little bit, but from a much lower base. And whether they can kind of get back to the trend line they were at before is highly questionable, particularly given the systemic uh, headwinds which I was alluding to before. What we haven't actually talked about so far is the importance of Chinese growth or, 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 or not in, unimportant, I suppose, but uh, I'm interested for your view. For countries outside of China, the global economy, does the rest of the world need China's economy to, to get back up and going? Uh, well, I mean, yes, the, the rest of Asia and certainly the rest of the world needs China to... Uh, to grow needs Chinese demand, but no more or less than it does other major economies. Um, you know, China just happens to be a country that has had historically a very high economic growth rate. We must remember also that China also uh, systemically has very large trade surpluses. Um, and when a country runs a big trade surplus, it's actually not doing that much for the rest of the world because it's exporting to the rest of the world more then it's importing. So if, if you're Malaysia or Poland or you know Chile or wherever you happen to be in the world, and um, you know you want to sell products to the Chinese consumer or to the into the Chinese economy, you need Chinese demand to grow much more strongly than it is. And that comes back to the problem that I've been uh, sort of going through, uh, or the theme I've been going on about um, during our interview, really, which is yeah. the, the relative weakness of demand in China's economy. Well, let's let's talk about that. Let's talk. Let's talk more about trade, imports, and exports. And let's talk specifically, firstly, uh, about the situation according to uh, figures out of Beijing. So exports, of course, are a huge driver of China's economy, and they have been in clear decline just recently, going from $315 billion in March to nearly $285 billion in May. It's not a very impressive map uh, graph that we're showing you there, but, but it does tell the story of, of exports declining, but also imports declining too. So, Professor Magnus, why is China exporting even less now than it was a year ago? when zero COVID was in place? Yeah, see, there's a, there's a lot of noise in these um, year-over-year comparisons on a kind of monthly basis, but I think um, it is becoming clearer, I think it's something that people probably expected to happen, actually, that the relative weakness of demand in the rest of the world would be a restraint on Chinese exports. Because obviously, as everybody I think knows by now, um, you know we've had huge increases in energy costs to accommodate. We've had high inflation uh, for retail and consumer um, products. Um, we've had um, just a general. We've had in, in the United States, for example, there have been um, problems with regional banks, which are having an impact on credit, um, or not credit contraction, but certainly taking the the kind of the, the fizz out of credit growth. Um, and so, lots of headwinds around in the world. And of course, China, as a major exporter, um, is basically feeling these chilly winds. Um, I mean, the hope uh, I think that we always have is that you know Chinese imports will be much stronger um, but that of course is down again to yeah. whether Chinese demand is growing more strongly yeah so let's sort of talk about the imports so down 4.5 percent 
last month. But like you say, there's a, a great deal of hope being pinned on, on those increasing. You think of sectors like the luxury sector, for example, in, here in Europe, which is pinning most of its future growth on China. So why are we seeing Chinese imports falling down? It's a little bit sort of horses for courses if you look at, you know, products. So, I mean, there's been a little bit of uh, stockpiling going on of commodities, agricultural goods and so on, uh, perhaps even semiconductors, you know, before the constraints on, on China become a little bit more um, tight. Um, but basically, the, the import numbers in China, I mean, are not really going to take off or, or become more satisfactory. Um, if there isn't the demand for foreign goods by Chinese companies and by Chinese consumers. So everything really comes back down to um, what's happening to consumption and investment and savings in the domestic economy. If things changed there, we would see big changes in the trade accounts, imports and possibly exports as well, but certainly on imports. Um, but um, it, there's, there's not really you know, a lot of ground for optimism that that's going to change very much at the moment, certainly. What's the the view in Beijing on, on imports, you know, dropping? Because we've actually been talking this week about Chinese-produced cars controlling the, the market there and, you know, there being less European cars being uh, imported there. Would ultimately Beijing like to see China importing less? Um, well, I... Actually, as long as I can remember, actually, I don't, I can't leave, I can't have, I have no recollection at all about a Chinese minister or Chinese uh, senior politician ever talking about um, Chinese trade other than, you know, in terms of what, uh, you know, China's industrial policy accomplishments are supposed to look like, given what the government is emphasizing um, over the next, you know, five to 20 years. Um, but I, I don't really recall there being any kind of, um, major discussion about, you know, the trade figures on a kind of short-term basis. I think the the focus that politicians have had, um, but it's more kind of re rhetoric, really, rather than action, but the focus that Chinese politicians have had on boosting the consumer and boosting consumer demand tell us implicitly that, that they would welcome, you know, kind of a pickup in imports. Um, um, because that's really the corollary of what would happen if consumption was stronger. Um, but as I say, I mean, most of what we've heard about um, policy on consumption really is about rhetoric and about statements and kind of, um, sort of campaigns to make people feel more optimistic about consumption, but no real policy measures to, uh, to change um, the facts on the ground, as we might say. Right. But just to finish, I'd like to look forward to, and to, to the future and ask whether we are ever going to see a Chinese economy that is like the Chinese economy before the COVID pandemic, or have the past three years changed something permanently? Oh, I, I think they have changed uh, a lot, actually. I mean, not just in terms of um, the economy's capacity uh, for growth, um, but of course, during the COVID years, um, we finally saw the tipping over of the real estate sector, which is a huge um, part of the economy. I mean, by some academics estimate, it, it's you know between 20 and 25 percent of um, of GDP. So, you know, if real estate is basically marking time or in contraction, um, which it probably will be over the next several years, I mean. China needs something else to, to fill the gap, and there isn't really anything uh, obvious at the moment. So I think that, um, uh, yeah, the last three years of, of zero COVID certainly have had um, important influence on China's capacity for growth. But actually, its limitations in terms of how fast it can grow were already pretty much baked in the cake beforehand. So, as I said, if you you know if you want to look out over the next kind of decade or so, I think China's speed limit for you know uh, the growth that it's capable of delivering is probably not much more than about two or three percent. It could be good growth, or it could be not so good growth. That depends very much on the policy stance the government takes.
OK, Professor George Magnus, it's been so interesting hearing what you've had to say. Thank you so much for joining us here for this TW Business Special. Thank you. And thanks also to you for watching. You can find plenty more from the DW Business team here on the DW News YouTube channel. And maybe I'll see you over in the next one you choose to watch.